you all for joining us today. I'm very excited to be here talking about portals. My name is Kate Valenti. I'm Unicon's Vice President of Operations. And uh, portals are sort of near and dear to my heart. When I joined the company, which is 16 years ago now, uh, I was the deployment lead for the portal product that Unicon had. So I have kind of watched portals grow and change over the years and am very happy to be here today with a couple of our friends that uh, work closely with Unicon uh, for their portal needs and just really excited to be talking about campus portals, um, the modernization effort to be able to make sure that we're reaching our campus constituents where they want to be and uh, hopefully we'll have a good bit of conversation for the group today. So I'm going to go ahead and move into slides here. There we go. All right, so we're here today to discuss um, the modern needs of a campus, and we're going to do that through the lens of a couple of real-world examples. So let me uh, introduce my panel here today. So happy to have Matt uh, Ripchinski from Foothill De Anza in sunny California, as well as Josh Wargo and Nick Woodle from Oakland University in what I was going to say is not so sunny Michigan, but it looks like maybe it is a beautiful sunny day in Michigan today. So. Um, uh, very happy to have you all here and appreciate your time to come and, and chat with us today. I also have ben Benito Gonzalez. He is a colleague of mine here at Unicon and he leads up our portals program internally. He's also a senior software developer for Unicon. And if you participate in the UPortal community at all, he's probably a familiar name as well as a familiar face. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, just to start, we, I'd like to set the context for the conversation so that our attendees know, you know what the, the campuses look like that are represented here. So we're going to talk about uh, campus, kind of the campus context for each of these schools. So Josh, I'm going to toss the first question out to you. What's your enrollment like at Oakland? How many students live on campus? Can you give, you, give us a sense of your campus life? Sure, absolutely. Uh, here at Oakland University, we have roughly 20,000 students enrolled, and about 3,200 of those students live here on campus. Great. And Matt, how about for Foothill? I think your, your uh, campus is a little bit different. Can you give us a characterization? Yeah, so uh, I checked for uh, spring 2019. We enrolled just under 30,000 students, and that's a little on the low side. Uh, Throughout the year, we may see peaks as high as 35,000. And uh, we're also on a quarter system, so sort of a combination of that high enrollment and those shorter academic terms, we actually have a really high turnover here. And, and you don't have folks who live on campus, is that right? Yeah, that's right. We don't have any kind of student housing or, or faculty housing. So um, every student has to get themselves to one of our colleges with a personal vehicle, um, public transportation and uh, so that means that they really do interact with us very heavily through technology most often uh, their mobile phone yeah that that's actually the follow-up question that I have so we talked about modern portals or what our campuses need today and a couple of the the key words that we're gonna hit today are user experience responsive design things like accessibility and customization so Sounds like responsive design is probably something that's high on your priority list, given that you have a lot of commuters. Can you can you comment on that? Yeah. So when we first had a campus portal, you know, I think uh, it was either a year before or a year after the first iPhone. So the idea of you know ready web access that was nice to work with, you know, with our original portal that was unheard of. And so by the time we got to U Portal, now it was the norm that we're all carrying around a smartphone and that we all want to interact with websites that look great on, on a small portrait sized phone. With our old portal, it used to be able to do the pinch and zoom and it was a really bad experience. So we made it a priority when going to use portal that the portal works on all screen sizes. That was a day one deliverable that we needed to hit and we did do it, it works great. Awesome. I'm gonna stay on, on Foothill for a minute here, Matt. You've described your campus portal as Grand Central Station. Uh, that's a characterization I really enjoy. Tell us what that means to you and to your campus. When, uh, when we first introduced a campus portal, which was around 2010, uh, the building work was even in 2009, that was also the first time in the history of this district where we went to web registration only and the old robo phone system was turned off. It was a really big monumental shift for how we interact with students. And so at that time, 
when we think of Grand Central Station, we, we wanted our students, our teachers, our staff to benefit from all this new software from a centralized place. Um, that's around the time that we implemented Banner. And, in, and so it's no matter what your affiliation is with the district, uh, from a technology perspective, we want the portal to be where you go to access your applications and any information that you need. So when you think of that, that, that train station, that, that Grand Central Station, the idea of the portal is you get there with a destination in mind and getting into the portal will get you there to the end. Great. Um, Nick, at, at Oakland, you're primarily serving information to students, if I understand correctly. Do you, do you also uh, have other constituent groups that use your portal? Does, it, does, it, does the Grand Central Station theme carry over? Yeah, so the same theme carries over to Oakland University in our instance of the portal. Um, our primary audience is the students. And they do come here for pretty much any campus resource, so they find their grades, which room or building their uh, courses are in, um, any holds on their account. Um, and then, like Matt was saying, uh, the Grand Central Station, they, they use it to go out to other resources throughout campus. Um, but students aren't our only users. We do have staff and faculty that use um, our instance of the portal. Can you, are there a couple of resources that you can think of that staff and faculty might use the portal for? Yeah, so one of the generic ones we offer all of them is um, we do like a leave balance for staff and faculty to see how much leave they might have. Um, some other tools that we offer to staff, uh, specifically advisors, is we have uh, an advisor page. So we have the we use uPortal's uh, built-in group management to kind of uh, limit that access to those pages. And then um, for something like the advisor suite, we go ahead and add uh, advisors to that group management part, and it allows them to go in and then uh, search students throughout campus, bring up their information like their grades, which courses they're enrolled in, um, if they have any holds or anything like that. And we use that group management for other things like administrative people who have access to do um, administrative tasks throughout uPortal. Um, we have a group for um, announcements, so anyone that's in that group can then add announcements. Um, and those are just a few to put out there. That's great. Yeah, groups management is one of those concepts that we talk about as providing personalization as well as flexibility within the, the framework. So, uh, Matt, are you also using groups management to, to target content to groups? Oh, yeah, very, very much so. Um, for our group strategy, though, it is uh, very tightly integrated with our backing database for student and staff data. We have a, a product here called Banner. Uh, which some in higher ed may be familiar with as an ERP. And, and in Banner, it's got tools for using a business rule to define populations of people. Um, and we're talking about like who's a student uh, versus who's an active student taking a class right now, who's an active employee receiving a paycheck, who has retired from the district. Um, and so Banner is taking care of those populations on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, if you're adding classes, dropping classes, paying bills, hiring employees, there is all of this churn on those groups. And then what we do with that from Banner is we send that to the portal for content targeting so that there's a really strong link from the business side uh, to the portal side. Great. And um, Matt, I know that you have a, a business process when folks want to add new content in the portal. Can you talk a little bit about what that process looks like? Yeah, on the IT side, we have a, a project request workflow that really starts at the executive level uh, where uh, an idea for um, a use of technology can be, can be started and get the conversation going around that. And that includes adding something new to the portal content-wise. And we want to ask, you know, why do you want this in the portal? Um, who's your audience? Um, does the new thing introduce confusion or conflicts with existing content? Um, who supports that new content? Um, when there are questions about it. And so once that discussion happens and this idea now exits as an approved project in that workflow, now it goes to a design phase where a specification is prepared, right? really outlining the expectations are uh, from the functional side, um, what our concerns may be on the technical side for implementation. Um, and then, you know, going back to Banner, for example, so most of these project requests um, incorporate data. Uh, from Banner, live actual data. So then 
you know, are we querying that data correctly? How is it formatted in the portal? Does it, is it meaningful so that when somebody sees it, they can understand it? So all those things, it goes through a nice process so that we get some high quality work, uh, and especially oral content out on the other end. Great. I'm going to move to accessibility um, and, and call out Benito to maybe talk a little bit about this. Uh, when we talk about modern, the needs of today's campuses, obviously accessibility is very important to make sure that we're providing the equal access. Benito, can you talk about uh, UPortal specifically, what um, support there is for accessibility and how that's addressed? Sure, thanks, Kate. Uh, so, you know, accessibility is an important legal concern, but uh, more importantly, it's something that affects student experiences, uh, especially those with challenges uh, regarding technology. But accessibility also helps uh, all users uh, as we refine the, the UI and then the UX. Um, <clears throat> so there's this group, Web Content Accessibility Standards, uh, uh, WCAG is what we call it for short, and they have a rating system, and so one of the targets is usually uh, WCAG AA level rating, and that's something UPortal targeted. So uh, our accessibility experts spent a week back in 2016, 2017 to review all the major pages of UPortal, and mm -hmm. as a result of that effort, about 155 issues were identified. These issues uh, focused on things like difficult to use forms, tabbing wasn't uh, ordering correctly, uh, difficult to see text, images without descriptions, and even color contrast. And some of these things seem small, but when you know they permeate a, a website or a web app, it makes things very challenging for people who are using screen readers and the like. So it took about three weeks of participation from the community to address these issues. Um, and, and they were resolved and we, we hit that target. Um, so what do we do in the meantime to keep you portal at that level? Uh, one, of the, one of the key things we have is whenever there's a pull request, a, a change request coming into the portal, there's a small checklist, uh, small as in about five or six items. And one of those is, does this still meet, this change meet the WCAG AA compliance? So that's something we're aware of all the time. It's kind of right there, very visible to us as developers to, to keep track of. On top of that, institutions will also have audits on occasion. We don't always hear about them. Occasionally we do. Uh, but the net impact for us is that occasionally we'll get a, a ticket saying that, hey, this new form or this, this change um, on a particular page uh, doesn't quite meet um, compliance uh, or failed our audit. So we'll review and, and we'll make sure we have that addressed as soon as possible. That's how we keep things balanced and keep things uh, meeting that AA uh, level rating moving forward. Thanks, that's a, a helpful view of the platform itself. So let's see how this plays out on an actual campus. So Josh, um, is this is accessibility something that you all spend time thinking of in Oakland and, and does the portal framework that you're using to make on that? Absolutely. Much as Benito said, I mean, accessibility is very important to us here at Oakland University as well. Uh, anytime we develop custom stuff for our portal, we always take it into consideration, but we also go back or we're currently going back uh, to our older parts of our custom development within the portal and uh, using tools such as Site Improve or Chrome Vox to, to look through those portal items and make sure that they do meet accessibility standards. And to echo what Benito said as well, if we did encounter anything within our portal that, that did not meet our accessibility standards, whether it was discovered during an audit or whatnot, that is something that we, we would pass back, yes. So while I have you, Josh, <clears throat> I want to move into the customization aspect. And uh, as I mentioned in the, the beginning, uh, both the schools represented here are running U portals. So the, the focus on customization is going to be from a U portal perspective. Um, but just as an illustration of a modern portal should have the ability for customization. We talked a little bit about groups management. So that's a way to customize who sees what. Um, but Josh, I'd love to know recently what you've done to extend U portal. The nice thing about the UPortal framework being an open source platform that you can sort of make it your own. And we're going to see two very different examples of that with these two schools. Um, but Josh, talk to us about what you've done recently to extend UPortal's features to meet the needs of your campus. 
Sure, absolutely. Um, so I, I can see our page there. You've got a little screenshot of it. Um, one of the, the coolest things that we're really excited about that we recently did was we uh, built in our own notification system within our portal right there next to the sign out button in the top right. You can see a little bell icon. Uh, if uh, this individual had any notifications, it would, it, they would be displayed there. Um, so, so traditionally, what we've done is uh, we've, we've identified key items that we need to contact students for. Um, and, and that's, like I said, traditionally been done through email. However, we've noticed that a lot of times we don't get a response, whether that's them not replying or, or not taking what we're, we're saying to them into account. So, so what we did here was we built a notification system that uh, we have notification types within there. And when the student logs into our portal, if there's any notifications waiting for them, uh, waiting for them, it's displayed to them first and foremost on their first login since the notification was added. That gives us an opportunity to directly interact with these students and uh, make sure that the uh, visibility of these notifications and the importance of these notifications is right there in front of them. What we've also done within this system, once again, going back to the customizability is, we have different tiers of notifications. So some notifications may be able to be dismissed, um, but not snoozed. Some may be able to be snoozed, but not dismissed. It's all, it's all based on the importance of them. And uh, we've had this for uh, almost a year now, um, and we, we've gotten a lot of great feedback on it. That's outstanding. Uh, one of the extensions of that, I understand that that notification strategy is tied in with your student success initiatives, and I can, I can imagine some of that nudging is, is sort of um, part and parcel with how you want to interact with those students, but can you talk more about that, how you feel like the notifications um, flexibility allows you to, uh, to, to meet your student success needs? Absolutely. So here at Oakland University, our first strategic goal is to foster that student success and built into that strategic goal there. There are various priorities. Um, some of them are increasing the retention rate, increasing graduation rates, and also um, uh, making sure that students that are in high risk courses, gateway courses, as we call them, um, that they have the best opportunity for success. So, so what we've done is we've geared our notifications to directly correlate with those priorities, such as we have a notification that uh, notifies a student anytime they have a hold on their account. We have a notification that notifies students if registration is open and they haven't registered for a course. Uh, we also have a notification, it's, it's one of our newer ones, that gives a student direct faculty feedback um, it's another one of our systems that faculty can alert students if, if it looks like they may have issues in their academics uh, relative to the course that the faculty member is teaching. And what this does is it, it allows our students to get those notifications first and foremost, tie them to student success, and then hopefully um, get them back on the track to, to improve that success. That's great. Um, in terms of where the information's coming, do you have a lot of integration built in here? Do you use a lot of systems outside of the portal to kind of pull the data? Um, and is that integrated into notifications? So yes, um, we, we pull our, our notification data from various sources. Like Matt's school, we also use Banner. Um, okay. we, pull some, we pull some of our data from there. Uh, we also have degree works here at Oakland University. We pull um, information from there for the progress to degree or progress to gradu uh, graduation notification. So yeah, we, we tie a lot of data from other sources back into this portal, yes. That's great, thank you. So we're gonna go to the, the Foothill um, view, which it, it's just interesting how different these can be. And Matt, I know that you've done some heavy customization to just the underlying uh, actually, maybe not heavy customization of the underlying framework, but heavy customization to the UI layer. Can you talk a bit about what you, uh, what Foothill has done with the portal framework? Yeah, uh, one of our uh, goals that and pain points we wanted to solve in going to U portal was the overall developer experience. Because with our previous portal, something called SunGuard Luminous, um, frankly, we came to hate working with it. And any time someone had an interesting idea. Uh, the answer was no, purely because of the hassle to develop um, on that old system and to deal with all the baggage. So when we went to uPortal, uh, one of the things that we did is uh, embrace the single page app 
experience. It's, it's a different paradigm for doing application design um, and quite a bit different from uh, maybe the traditional ways that other colleges have worked with uPortal. Uh, but that uh, advantage of that approach has allowed us to kind of throw our arms wide open to uh, all sorts of design patterns that are already vetted out there in the uh, web community. Uh, an example of this would be a, we use a rich data grid uh, on our portal home screen. It's not actually visible in that screenshot, um, but if you are a student and you have uh, enrollments in classes, you get a nice little display of what you're enrolled in and easy access uh, to services like Canvas. But that grid, uh, we used it specifically because it looks great on a desktop and it looks great on a mobile phone. And it was nice, it was something we didn't need to write. We were able to go and just grab that component, um, throw that onto our layout, and, and really it was something that the community was able to provide that we could take advantage of. It was a solved problem. So we, we have departed from some traditional ways of working with uPortal, uh, but along the way we use some nice standardized tooling so that uh, maintenance doesn't get out of hand. And we've been able to use the same tooling for our portal work um, that we do for our non-portal work. So from a staff perspective, we're actually able to rally around this common skill set um, within our department and uh, everyone's able to level up at the same, you know, at the same pace with the same set of uh, tools. That's great. I know staff is always a concern uh, for, for portal deployments. For some reason, it seems like you get a lot of very specialized people. So making it more of a broad skill set, uh, that, that's a really smart way to, to make sure that you have good coverage from a staff perspective. And then can you talk about your integrations as well? So the question I posed to Josh around, uh, you know, just where is, where is data originating in what you're doing? And I think the screenshot is, is a bit self-explanatory, but it seems like you too have a lot of backend um, systems that you're using that you're surfacing data through the portal, but uh, that the portal is really just that entry point. Yeah, you know, we do surface quite a bit of data. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have much of an interesting role here as a programmer at the district, but if you look at the very bottom of that screenshot, you see that area called tasks. Now, if you are a, a manager, an administrator in the college, then we're querying Banner to find out if you have any open financial documents that need your approval. So you got a PO or requisition more specifically that needs your attention. Um, we're going to be showing you there in tasks uh, that that needs to get done. Um, in the future, we'll be doing integration with banner time cards. So again, as an approver or supervisor, do you have employees under your watch where it's time to approve their time card? Uh, we're going to bring that to the surface. Um, there's some discussion about using tasks to um, shepherd students towards getting things done, especially if they're newly enrolled, um, taking care of their orientation, um, uh, taking care of other housekeeping chores, declaring a major, and so forth. So all of those things, they're at the surface of the portal, but they're driven by data from an underlying system like Banner. Great, thank you. And so Matt, what's next? What, what is it that Foothill has on the roadmap to build out next in the portal? Well, we're also gonna be doing a, a targeted message solution, very much like what you saw there in Oakland. Um, we're gonna be using a, a product from Elucian called Banner Communication Management. It's a, it's a whole suite. Uh, of tools with its own sign-on and GUI and whatnot, but it allows a functional user to go in and define populations using um, familiar rules and banner and, and uh, different tools that they know how to do uh, to work with. And from communication manager, deliver those targeted announcements directly to the portal and show that they're on their home screen. So I don't have any, uh, I didn't provide a screenshot of what that looks like, but uh, it'll be something that probably gets slotted above favorites. And, and very much like you saw with Oakland, we're looking to, um, bring all kinds of important notifications to the surface to uh, make the portal more interesting, a, a more important place to go to when uh, you need to interact with our uh, campus or our colleges. Fantastic. And, and Josh, we didn't ask um, what the framework is that you use for notifications. Can you, so we have an example uh, for Matt on using a, an Elucian product. Are you using something that you've developed custom or something that's open source? So we actually developed a uh, custom Java Spring Boot app on the back end that is run to, to bring all the data into our Postgres uh, database environment. And then from there, the notifications are already available for the students. I, we, we built it out further. This is probably a whole, a whole webinar that we could do just on my notifications or just on our notification system. Um, but we're also collecting analytics. Um, 
date read, date snooze, date dismiss, how many times did they snooze it, uh, when was it put in versus when they first saw it, anything that, that can be used by our, uh, our advising staff to, to further uh, foster student success. Yeah, that actually might be an interesting follow-up topic for a webinar because I know there are a lot of schools that are looking at notifications and how to how to build out those frameworks to, to do all of those things that you just discussed. So thank you. Um, and Nick, this last question uh, in terms of customization is for you. So what does Oakland plan to do next with, uh, with Portal? What's on your roadmap? Um, so we got quite a few things coming up. Uh, one thing to to go off what Josh was just talking about with the analytics piece of the notifications is we're actually looking at building kind of a administrative view or um, like a view that we can give for specific groups um, because not all of our notifications are for the same group. Uh, we might have different departments here at the university that have different notifications. And so we want to be able to show them the actual analytics and how many people are reading them, how many people are dismissing them, how many times they're, uh, snoozing uh, an alert, especially when it comes to like, you have a hold on your account and you know, you read it 18 times. Why, why haven't you uh, acted on this hold? Um, so we want to be able to provide those, that kind of information um, for these departments. Um, and then a lot of the other things we're doing is we're going back to some of the older pieces within our portal and rewriting them and making them better. One, for example, is our advising um, page. Um, this was written a long time ago, but one of our, actually our student developers is working on this and providing more tools for the advisors so that it kind of gives them a central location to get all of the student information when they meet with their, their students. Awesome. Um, so I have kind of one final question for everyone. Um, before I do that, I just want to uh, call out some of the topics we talked about. So we talked about things like to user experience, responsive design, accessibility, customization, groups targeting. Um, if our attendees today have other concepts that they consider for a modern portal, I'd love for you to uh, put your questions in the chat. We will open it up to Q&A for all of our panelists at the end. So if you have a question, something we haven't addressed or something you say, well, you couldn't talk about a modern portal without this thing and we didn't hit it, um, please put your, your question in chat. And we'll be happy to, to throw that over to our folks here. So I'm going to uh, ask Benito, <clears throat> as a longtime supporter of the community and participant in portals, what are you most excited about um, that you portal is doing at this point? And I, I have a screenshot up to support your answer. Hopefully it's the right one. <laughs> it is the right screenshot <laughs> for the second part. But um, before I get to that, the, the what really happened with uPortal 4 to uPortal 5 it was huge. Working with some of our clients that are going through the upgrades, how we've changed from this monolithic huge repo with all the source code and customizations were just floating all over the place, untracked often and hard to, to relocate. Uh, now with uPortal start as a place of customization and configuration, it's easy to pick up, oh, I, I need to customize this particular piece of Java code or I have this a unique configuration. It's tracked in this very lightweight repo and it's been just, a, just fantastic working on these things, being able to drill down to an issue that's either with the community product or a customization. Um, so that's where we're at today, and, and what I really like moving forward are web components. Uh, I was cautious when they were first introduced. There were some issues, especially with compatibility with older browsers, and we still have some concerns around older browsers. That's mostly been resolved, and now I'm seeing these fantastic steps forward where a collection of web components uh, create an entire view of the portal out of other web components. That's great, but further, we can take parts of those web components and use them in completely different layouts and in different ways. So I've, I've seen an initial uh, web component that's been used in three or four other uPortal uh, installations, which is exactly what we wanna see as reuse. Another great thing about web components is that, um, as Matt was alluding to, there's, there's 
curve, this, this learning curve with uPortal and Portlets. With web components, it's newer, it's modern. Uh, you can use modern tooling. You can develop these content pieces outside of the portal with very fast turnaround. And then once you've got it all polished up and you're ready to do some real testing, you drop it in the portal, which isn't very challenging at all. A couple of portlet definitions and add it to your layout and bam, you've got this thing in there and you can tweak it. The only challenge is making sure that your web component um, honors um, the CSS that the portal supposedly brings to you know, this entire page. We, we need to bring in some of that styling into the web components where web components generally wanna keep styling out. So that's just a, a little bit of a, a, something to address as you develop web components or someone develops them, but um, it's, it really seems to be the future and I'm excited about that. And for folks who don't really know what a web component entails, who may be listening today, can you can you use this screenshot to demonstrate anything on here that may be a web component? Yeah, absolutely. So it's starting from the top and moving over to the upper right of the screen capture, you'll see the uh, waffle there. If you click on that, you would see a collection of, of uh, icons that launch you into particular portlets. So that is uh, a web component, the waffle. Uh, menu. Next to that is notifications icon. That is a web component. You click on that and you'll see a drop down of uh, notifications. Um, the image uh, right there um, that says get ahead, that is a web component of a carousel, image carousel. So images will be rotating through there um, every minute. That's configurable. Uh, also, the middle section where you see schedule, upcoming, assignments, et cetera, that is another web component that brings in portlet or other dynamic content. So all those, those aren't screen captures or images. Those are actual uh, portlets that are driving the back of each one of those little squares. And there's about nine of them. And then that just got cut off, there is another slider. So uh, in this particular image, uh, screen capture, there are a lot of carousels that are sliding around, um, but then also in the upper right, there's a ton too, and there's also some that are embedded lower on. So it's it's just a very flexible technology. It's a way of essentially creating a little bit of the page that you can stack together and make interesting layouts. Thank you. So that, yeah, the answer is everything here seems to be a web component. So it's a very interesting way to uh, to aggregate the UI. Uh, great. So this last question is for uh, Matt, Nick, or Josh, or all three. I'm just curious what uh, final thoughts that you have about the portal that you're running today. I think you all have some good um, long context with portals. And so any uh, you know, thoughts of an impact that your portals are having on campus or anything else that you'd want to share with the group today? Sure. I'll go first, Kate. Great. Um, I, it's very useful for us. We've, we found that, that, as it's been mentioned multiple times, that central station idea. Um, but not only that, it, uh, customizability, if we get a request from another department on campus and, and they wanna include something for the students or aimed at the students, directed towards the students within the portal, uh, the integration, the customizability, it's, it's not difficult. Uh, it, it's very easy to, to go out and as long as we can get that data, whether it be from Banner or, or, or another, another source of data that we use here at Oakland University, it's very easy to integrate what they're asking for into the portal into an appealing way that that it it grabs the student's attention in the way that it was intended to great thanks josh matt or nick oh nothing for me i think okay. josh uh, nailed it there okay great let's see um so we're going to open it up for questions and uh, this is for anything that you saw or anything that you might be interested in having these folks uh, comment on. So Joanna is supporting us from a, a marketing perspective today. Joanna, do we have any questions in the queue? Yes, we have one question from Matthew DeKine. Um, he said, I think search is a key component of modern portal. How do you ensure people can find what they need when they aren't sure what it's called? Great question. Any of our panelists have a, a perspective on search? I could, I could take, uh, I mean, uh, in our portal here at Foothill De Anza, you know, we've done a, an extensive integration with a, an open source product called Apache Solar. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is we have an excellent search engine attached to our portal for content. And also as a white page is um, out of banner so that you can find a person by their name, their job title, their department, 
um, where they are in the organization. And as you see on our screenshot, search is very prominent there in the top left. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of favorites on my portal, but when you come in as a new user, you know, it's more of a blank canvas. Uh, so we wanted people to be able to find things and we attach keywords to pieces of content that aren't in the title of whatever that thing is. So when you're looking for um, ads and drops or um, certain terminology around payroll or uh, different business processes, we try to create this big soup um, that you can search and, and pluck out multiple things. And you can even type in the word payroll in there and get both portal content and also a directory of people who work in the payroll department. And just as an example, if you're wondering as a new employee, you know, questions and who to ask. That's excellent. Oakland, have you addressed search in, in your portal? Yeah, so we have a search uh, that's built in, but it, it uses our main campus uh, website's search engine, uh, which is essentially Google to search our, our website for the content that you're looking for. So it's not gonna be limited just to our portal. Um, it's to all of campus resources. Okay. Great. Great question. Thank you. Joanna, any other questions? That is the only question. That's the only one. All right. mm -hmm. Well, oh, maybe something just popped up. Or maybe it was a thank you. Yeah, he said thank you. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you all uh, for participating with us here today. And we'd love to continue the conversation. If there's anything that you need, any uh, follow up thoughts you can send um, in through Unicon. Um, but thank you so much for your interest in, in being here with us today. And maybe we'll have a follow-up webinar on notifications, and hopefully you can all join us for that. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Kate. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.